The hindsight of history means we now know much and more that Queen Rhaenyra did not after her capture on Dragonstone. This is mostly due to the work of Grand Maester Munkin, as it was his true telling, based in a large part of the account of Grand Maester Orwell, that revealed how Aegon II came to Dragonstone and took the castle from under his sister. The mystery of Aegon's escape from King's Landing could now be answered. It was Laris Strong, the clubfoot, who spirited the king and his children out of the city when the Queen's dragons first appeared in the skies above King's Landing. No man knew the Red Keep better than Strong, so as not to pass through any of the city gates where they might have been seen and remembered. Lord Laris led them out through some secret passage of Maegor the Cruel, which only he had knowledge of. A dark maze of tunnels, impossible to find and perilous to navigate. It was Lord Laris who decreed the now fugitives should part company as well, so that even if one of them was taken, the others might win free. So Rickard Thorne was commanded to deliver the two-year-old Prince Maelor to Lord Hightower. Princess Jehera, a sweet and simple girl of six, was put in the charge of Sir Willis Fell, who swore to bring her to safety, to Storm's End and the care of the Baratheons. Neither knew where the other was bound, so neither could betray the other if captured. Only Laris himself knew that the king, stripped of his finery and clad in salt-stained fisherman's clothes, had been concealed among a load of codfish on a fishing skiff in the care of a bastard knight with family on Dragonstone. Once she learned the king and his heirs were long gone, the club but reasoned Rhaenyra was sure to send men hunting after him as well. But a boat leaves no trail upon the waves, A few hunters would ever think to look for Aegon on his sister's own island, right under her nose, in the very shadow of her stronghold. All this Grand Maester Orwell had heard from Lord Strong's own lips. And there, Aegon might have remained hidden, yet harmless to the Queen, dulling his pain with wine and hiding his burn scars beneath a heavy cloak, had Sunfire not made his way to Dragonstone. We might ask what drew him back to the Dragon Mount, for many have. Was the wounded dragon, with his half-healed broken wing, driven by some primal instinct to return to his birthplace, the smoking mountain where he had emerged from an egg, or did he somehow sense the presence of King Aegon on the island, across the long leagues and stormy seas, and fly there to rejoin his rider? Certain Eustace goes so far as to suggest that some fires sense Aegon's desperate need, but who can presume to know the heart of a dragon? After Lord Wallace Mouton's ill-fated attack drove him from the field of ash and bone outside Rook's Rest, history loses sight of Sunfire for more than half a year. Certain tales told in the halls of crabs and brunes suggest the dragon might have taken refuge in the dark, piney woods and caves of Cracklaw Point. Though his torn wing had mended enough for him to fly, it had healed at an ugly angle and it remained weak. Sunfire could no longer soar, nor remain in the air for long but must needs struggle to fly even a short distance. The full mushroom certainly says, whereas most dragons move through the sky like eagles, some fire became no more than a great golden fire-breathing chicken, hopping and fluttering from hill to hill. Yet some fire crossed the waters of Blackwater Bay regardless. It was some fire that the sailors on the Nessaria had seen, attacking Grey Ghost. Sir Robert Quince had blamed the cannibal, but Tom Tangletongue, who heard more than he said, applied the volunteers with L, making note of all the times they mentioned the attacker's golden scales. The cannibal, as he knew well, was black as coal, and so the two Toms and their cousin set sail in their small boat to seek out Grey Ghost's killer. Burn King and the maimed dragon each found new purpose in the other. From a hidden lair on the desolate eastern slopes of the Dragon Mount, out of view of most of the island's residents, Aegon ventured forth each day at dawn, taking to the sky again for the first time since Rook's Rest, whilst the two Toms and their cousin, Master Waters, returned to the other side of the island to seek out men loyal to Aegon, willing to help him take the castle. Even on Dragonstone, Queen Rhaenyra's own seat and stronghold, they found many who misliked the queen for reasons both good and ill. Some greed for brothers, sons and fathers slain during the sowing of the dragon seeds or during the bloody battle of the gullet. Some hoped for plunder or advancement, while others believed a son must come before a daughter, giving Aegon the better claim to the Iron Throne. The queen had taken her best men with her to King's Landing. On its island, protected by the sea snake ships and its high Valyrian walls, Dragonstone seemed secure, so the garrison her grace left to defend it was small, made up largely of men judged to be of little use, greybeards and green boys, the halt and the slow and crippled, men recovering from wounds, men of doubtful loyalty and men suspected of cowardice. Over them, 
Rhaenyra placed Sir Robert Quince, an able man grown old and fat. Quince was a steadfast supporter of the Queen, all agreed, but some of the men under him were less leal, harbouring certain resentments and grudges for old wrongs, real or imagined. Prominent amongst them was Sir Alfred Broom. Broom provided more than willing to betray his Queen in return for a promise of a lordship, lands and gold should Aegon regain the throne. His long service with the garrison allowed him to advise the king's men on Dragonstone's strengths and weaknesses, which guards could be bribed or won over, and which must need be killed or imprisoned. When it came, the fall of Dragonstone took less than an hour. Men brought over by Broom opened the postern gate during the hour of the ghost to allow Sir Marston Waters, Tom Tangletongue, and their men to slip into the castle unobserved, while one band seized the armory. Another took Dragonstone's leal guardsmen and master at arms into custody. Sir Marsden surprised Grand Maester Geraldus in his rookery, so no word of the attack might escape by Raven. Sir Alfred himself led the men who burst into the Castilian's chambers to surprise Sir Robert Quince. As Quince struggled to rise from his bed, Broom drove a spear into his huge pale belly. Mushroom, who knew both men well, says Sir Alfred misliked and resented Sir Robert. This may be well believed, for the thrust was delivered with such force that the spear went out of Sir Robert's back through the feather bed and straw mattress into the floor beneath. Only in one respect did the plan go awry. As Tom Tangletongue and his ruffians smashed down the door of Lady Baylor Targaryen's bedchamber to take her prisoner, the girl slipped out of her window, scrambling across the rooftops and down the walls until she reached the yard. The king's men had taken care to send guards to secure the stables where the castle dragons had been kept. But Baylor had grown up in Dragonstone and knew ways in and out that they did not. By the time her pursuers caught up with her, she'd already loosed Moondancer's chains and strapped a saddle onto her. So it came to pass that when King Aegon II flew Sunfire over the Dragon Mount's smoking peak and made his descent, expecting to make a triumphant entrance into the castle safely in the hands of his own men, with the Queen's loyalists slain or captured, he rose up and met Bela Targaryen. Prince Daemon's daughter by Lady Lena Valarium. Moondancer was a young dragon, pale green with horns and crests and wing bones of pearl. Aside from her great wings, she was no larger than a warhorse and weighed less. She was very quick, however, and Sunfire, though much larger, still struggled with his malformed wing and had taken a fresh wound from Grey Ghost. They met amidst the darkness that comes just before dawn, shadows in the sky lighting the night with their fires. Moondancer eluded some fire's flames, eluded his jaws, darted beneath grasping claws that came around and raked the large dragon from above, opening a long smoking wound down his back and tearing at his injured wing. Watchers below said that some fire lurched drunkenly in the air, fighting to stay aloft, while Moondancer turned and came back at him, spitting fire. Sunfire answered with a furnace blast of golden flame so bright it lit the yard below like a second sun, a blast that took Moondancer full in the eyes. Like as not, the young dragon was blinded in an instant, yet she still flew on, slamming into Sunfire in a tangle of wings and claws. As they fell, Moondancer struck at Sunfire's neck repeatedly, tearing out mouthfuls of flesh, whilst the elder dragon sank his claws into her underbelly, robed in fire and smoke, blinded and bleeding. Moondancer beat her wings desperately as she tried to break away, but all her efforts did was slow their fall. The watchers in the yard scrambled for safety as the dragons slammed into the hard stone, still fighting. On the ground, Moondancer's quickness proved of little use against Sunfire's size and weight. The green dragon soon lay still. The golden dragon screamed his victory and tried to rise again, only to collapse back to the ground with hot blood pouring from his wounds. King Aegon had leapt from the saddle when the dragons were still 20 feet from the ground, shattering both of his legs. Lady Baylor stayed with Moondancer all the way down. Burned and battered, the girl still found the strength to undo her saddle chains and crawl away as her dragon coiled in her final death throes. When Alfred Broom drew his sword to slay her, Marsden Walters wrenched the blade from his hand and Tom Tangleton carried her to the maester. Thus did Aegon II win the ancestral seat of House Targaryen. But the price he paid for it was dire. Sunfire would never fly again. He remained in the yard where he had fallen, feeding on the carcass of Moondancer, and later on, sheep slaughtered for him by the garrison. Aegon II lived the rest of his life in great pain, though to his honour, when Grand Maester Geraldus offered him milk with the poppy, he refused. 
I shall not walk that road again, he said, nor am I such a fool to drink any potion you might prepare for me, as you are my sister's creature. At the king's command, the chain that Princess Rhaenyra had torn from Grandmaster Orwell's neck and given to Jarvis was now used to hang him. He was not given the quick end of a hard fall and a broken neck, but rather a slow strangulation, kicking as he grasped for air. Three times, when he was almost dead, Geraldus was let down and allowed to catch his breath, only to be hauled up again. After the third time, he was disemboweled and dangled before some fire, so the dragon might feast upon his legs and innards. But the king commanded that enough of the Grand Maester be saved, so he might greet my sweet sister on her return. Not long after, as the king lay in the stone drum's great hall, his broken legs bound and splinted. The first of Queen Rhaenyra's ravens arrived from Duskendale. When Aegon learned that his half-sister would be returning on the Volantide, he commanded Sir Alfred Broom prepare a suitable welcome for her homecoming. All of this is known to us now. None of this was known to the Queen when she stepped ashore into her brother's trap. <laughs>